So today we're going to talk about physical modeling synthesis. What is it? How do we use it? Why we shouldn't be afraid of it? And maybe why we should keep our expectations of it modest. Now this video is a part of my series on MPE sound design, but we will be light on the MPE today. So if you're just interested in the physical modeling, that's mostly what this video is going to be about. So if you're new to it, physical modeling can be a little bit intimidating and confusing. I looked through the synths that I have available to me and I just made a little list of the parameters available in the physical modeling. And I came up with stiffness, density, inharmonicity, brightness, material, protrusion, position, damping, finger mass, finger stiff, fret stiff, termination, mass, tension, media loss, strength, ratio, color, and bleed. The impression you might get is that these are all real things. And they have real meaning to the some sort of physics engine in your computer in which there is a virtual string being plucked in a virtual world, or perhaps bowed with a bow that was strung with the hair of nine white stallions fed nothing but the finest oats and hay. That's not really what's happening with physical modeling synthesis. We're not dipping a microphone into the matrix and recording the authentic strains of Neo's favorite banjo. What we are dealing with is a particular algorithm, and it's really a very simple algorithm. And once we understand it and understand what the components of it are doing, that should clear a lot of things up and make it much more fun and easy to get into. So let's take a quick look at this Wikipedia page. This is our algorithm. This is the car plus strong string synthesis. And it's really quite simple. You can see the whole thing in this diagram. We have some noise as an input. We have a filter with a feedback loop. And then we have the output. And this is a, a fairly nice little description of how it works. Four lines, easy enough to understand. Now, I want to make this even simpler. There you go. That's the car plus strong algorithm. We have these two parts that we're going to be dealing with. The exciter, which is Wikipedia says it's a noise burst. It's not always a noise burst. It might be a continuous noise, which we would use for a bowed string or a um, wind instrument or something like that. Or it could be a burst of noise, which we would use for a pluck kind of sound or a hammered sound. The exciter will always be a sound. And it can be any sound that you want. And one of the things we'll spend a lot of time covering is how to get the right kind of sound in there. There are some that work better than others. Generally, for this sound, you don't want anything that has a strong tone to it, because that tone will get repeated by the resonator and create a sort of drone, which can be cool, but it will also, you know, musically interfere with your sound. So this exciter will typically be some sort of noise. Meanwhile, the resonator, resonator is going to be something that repeats the exciter sound, and it will repeat it on a delay. And the length of the delay will correspond to the intended pitch of your sound. So if there was a, a real physical simulation going on here, your pitch would be determined by the length of the string, the tension in the string, the stiffness, sure, and the mass of the string. But we're really not going to need to deal with any of that because we just tell the computer what pitch we want it to play. Now, another way, way to look at these two elements, the exciter would be your pick, or your bow, or your hammer, or your breath. It's the thing that is giving energy to the physical system. It's typically not a pitched sound. Your pick is always going to vibrate at the same frequency, no matter what note you're playing on the guitar. So it's really the resonator that's going to handle the pitch. And the resonator in this metaphor is 
the string or the column of air or the metal bar or the membrane. The resonator is the thing that is directly receiving the energy of the exciter and vibrating in response. So what about the stiffness, density, inharmonicity, brightness, etc., etc., etc.? These are all things that are going to shape either the sound of the exciter or the resonance of the resonator. And they are typically going to be filters or mixers or amplifiers. They are going to be common synthesis tools and not magical math equations that you need a PhD to understand. I do want to say that one thing that attracts people to physical modeling is the hope that it will give them a more natural, realistic, acoustic sound. But if we're using MPE, a lot of that is already going to be accomplished because we have a human performance. And a physically modeled trumpet is not necessarily going to sound any more realistic than an old-fashioned narrow pulse and filter played with MPE. So physical modeling is not magic. It's just a different method of synthesis. Okay, there are a couple quick maintenance things I want to do that will help us out for the rest of this video and in the future. If you're not following along in Surge and you just want to watch and see the physical modeling explanations, you can skip ahead to the next timestamp. But we're going to do a couple quick things. We're going to make some minor adjustments to our initial patch. So first of all, if you have a velocity curve that you like, which you might have built during the plucks and envelopes tutorial, if you have that patch saved, you can load that now. I have one that I liked uh, behind the bridge. Okay, And I want to come down to the velocity curve. What I want to do is put this velocity curve into our initial patch so that we'll always have it handy. I'm just going to check this. Yes, that's the curve I made. Now, if you go over here, there's a tiny hidden menu. You might have noticed Surge has a lot of these tiny little buttons that turn out to be really useful. What we can do with this one is we can save this curve as a preset. So that's what I'm going to do. And now I can go load that any time that I that I need it. I will still need to do a couple setup things with it, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now that I have a velocity curve, I'm going to open up my, my init patch. And there are just a couple quick things I want to do here. First, I want to check the filter cutoff. You might still have a timbre curve modulation on the filter cutoff. If you do, click the red X and get rid of it. And then in the effects, I have this reverb on here, and the mix is 100%. That's way too high. I'm going to click that down to 50. What reverb mix you want is a matter of taste, so put this wherever you want. But if you're going to be at 100%, that should not be by accident, which is what I did. Now I'm going to go down to LFO3 and select it. I'm going to load that velocity curve that I just saved. Now I still need to do two things. I'm just going to rename it because it didn't remember the name. So this will be velocity curve. And then it also lost its modulation. So I'm going to go down to phase, add modulation from MIDI velocity, 99%. Now I'm going to save the init patch, and I'm going to save it with a new name. Number three. So Surge gives us a few different ways that we can do physical modeling. There's the string synthesizer. There are a couple options in the twist oscillator. The uh, inharmonic string and modal resonator are both physical modeling synths. But there's also a more bare bones way of doing it that will give us a little more control over what's happening. So let's go load up a template. 
they have helpfully given us in its car plus strong. And let's take just a quick look at what this is doing. Our oscillators are all muted, and our only sound is coming from this last mixer track, which is which is noise that is kind of always running and is controlled with this noise color slider up here. The noise has an envelope on it. This is using the LFO en envelope generator, and it's just going to give us this quick little tick of noise. So that noise is going to be our exciter. The resonator is going to be this comb filter. But I'm going to make a quick change here. I don't want the comb filter in this slot because I might want to put another filter in between the exciter and the resonator. So I can go over to filter two and set it up the same way. Effect comb plus. These sliders here are key tracking for each filter. This is turned up all the way. Then the pitch that you're getting from MIDI is going to serve as the cutoff frequency of the filter. So this is now a tuned filter. And I'm going to turn the first filter off. Back to filter two. You want the resonance up very high. It has to feed back to create the tone that we're looking for. So a quick word about filters. Let's look at another of these hidden little buttons here. Little filter shape between the filters. It's going to show you the shape of your filters on either side. Let me turn on a low pass filter here so we can see what we normally have. So, this is showing you that it's letting your low frequencies pass through in this blue area, and your high frequencies are being filtered out. And the cutoff frequency is sort of like a delay time. That is the pitch at which your resonance will sound if you have key tracking on and resonance turned way up. So I could play just this filter right now and it would give us pretty much a sine wave because the resonance is all the way up. And that can be very useful for a sub bass or a kick drum and also just sounds cool in general use. But it's not particularly suited to Car Plus Strong because it is filtering out a lot of interesting frequencies that we want to be able to hear. This is pretty much just another way of doing a sine wave. We turn this one off. Let's look at filter two that we're actually using. It's called a comb filter because it has this comb shape here. And if I drag this down to 200 hertz, we can see that these peaks are occurring in the harmonic series. So we have 400 hertz, 600, 800, 1K. These are our familiar harmonics that, we're, that we talked about in the video on the alias oscillator. So the comb filter is going to let all the sound pass through pretty much, but we're going to have these resonant peaks at our harmonics, and that's going to give us a nice harmonic sound. So the comb filter is going to be the resonator in our exciter into resonator paradigm. There are other filters we can use for this. There are other filter configurations. But of the ones that Surge gives us, really just these two comb filters are going to be helpful. The others are all going to either do weird things or just filter out too many frequencies that we want. Now, a couple more things I want to do to set up this sound. This is going to be really quiet right now. So I'm going to click on the envelope. And I'm just going to make sure that this volume gets modulated all the way up. Now it's going to be too loud, so I'm going to double click the gain and set it to zero. And also on this envelope, I want velocity control. So I'm going to turn down this amplitude, go over to LFO3 and load in my velocity curve. Modulate with velocity 99%. Rename it velocity curve. And back to the envelope. I'm going to modulate this amplitude with the velocity curve. 
99%. Now I should be able to play a sound. So there we have a nice little clavichord with pitch bends and vibrato available because we're using MPE. I find it with a lot of these physical modeling sounds, the low end is very lacking. And it's not that the that we don't have anything down there in those frequencies, it's just that it's very quiet. So I'm just going to add some gain. I'm going to play a little with this amp, with this amp envelope. We don't really need the sustain all the way down because our sound is going to decay naturally. Our feedback loop is not feeding back 100%, even when our resonance is all the way up. So this sound will decay over time. And I'm also going to turn the release up a little bit because I want to hear more of the tail. I don't know if you've ever played a clavichord. The instrument is a very different interface to the notes than a clavichord is, but the quality of the sound here is definitely giving me very, it's feeling a lot like a clavichord to me. So now we are working with plucked sounds because we've got this envelope on the noise. I would say that plucked sounds are what physical modeling is really, really good at. We're going to find a lot of annoyances trying to do other kinds of sounds, but the plucked sounds are really the bread and butter for this. They're fantastic. So let's just play with some different ways of modifying our noise to give ourselves a different instrument. Now, right now we're using the, we're using the default noise. And the only thing we really have control over of the noise itself is the color. So let me turn this down and hear what it sounds like down here. Kind of a darker sound to it. I'm going to bypass this filter for a second. I just drag the balance all the way over to the filter that's turned off. And I'm just going to turn this up and bypass the envelope so we can just listen to the noise for a second. So all of the frequencies you hear in there are being repeated by our comb filter, and that's what's going to give our, our sound its characteristic brightness. Turn these things back on. So with a darker noise, our sound is more piano-ish. It's still not very piano-ish, but it's much more piano-ish than it is clavichord-ish. We've gone zero percent here. These are mostly going to give us not very useful noises. There's just no low end at all, no matter how much I turn on my EQ. So I'll typically stay below zero percent in the noise color. Now, how else can we shape this noise? The envelope we're using, let me turn up this amplitude so we can see it. This is going to have a big effect on our sound. How much of the exciter gets through and repeated by the resonator. 
So if I turn up the decay, We can hear that more of that noisiness is getting through. It's sounding less like a clavichord or a piano. And more like a weird digital noise machine. These sounds can be very useful too, but it's not so much the natural acoustic sound that we might be looking for in using physical modeling. If I turn the decay down a lot, I'm going to turn the attack all the way down. That's not quite what I expected to happen there. So that big click was coming from there being a little bit of attack. But with zero attack, there's no click. So that's a little counterintuitive. And that would be one of the things that I would classify as arcane about physical modeling. There are a lot of things that you really only learn through trial and error. Now, there are other things we can do to shape this noise. Let's try a bandpass filter. That's one that looks like this. Now that I'm using the bandpass, it's going to be filtering out a lot of the frequencies that are not being caught up in my resonance in the comb filter. So maybe I can get away with a longer decay on this without it sounding so noisy. Turn the decay back down and bypass this filter again. One thing I neglected to show you in the envelopes video, and I'm very sorry, the curvature of this LFO EG can be controlled by this deform slider. So all the way up, it's a concave shape you can see here. And all the way down, it's going to be a convex shape. Let's see what that does to our sound. Okay, I've got a few more pluck things to show you. One thing that I really like to do, I'm going to mute the noise and turn on oscillator one. Modulate the volume of oscillator one using this envelope. And I'm going to give us some more decay in this envelope. Then I'm going to set the oscillator type to wavetable, and load a wavetable from file. These impulse responses are usually used for reverbs, convolution reverb. They are included in the zip file linked in the description. So let's listen to one of them. That's the sound of me hitting this box that I made and nailed all kinds of strings and springs to. Let's try the second one. The second one's probably going to work better for us because it has more low frequencies. So now we're using this impulse instead of the noise to be our exciter. 
And a quirk of the wavetable oscillator, if you load in a file that is not, it doesn't have the proper headers to be read as a wavetable, it will just be played as a looping sample, which would be really useful. You would set it to re-trigger here. It would be very useful, except it doesn't loop seamlessly. There's a little gap. So that's disappointing, but it is useful for this purpose. Now, this is our exciter. It's not going to be a pitched element. So let's turn off the key tracking. A very different kind of sound. I'm going to turn down. We can get a lot of use out of using these transpose buttons for the oscillator. It's going to change the character of the sound a lot. Now, since this is just a short burst of noise, we don't really need to be applying this envelope to it so much. I'm just going to turn this sustain all the way up. So this will still have its level provided by our velocity curve but it's not going to be shaped. So using these samples is a way of getting a lot of very interesting sounds that you have much more control over than just this noise color would give you. Now, because this box that I hit has strings on it and springs and things, it does have some tonal characteristics. And you can hear those coming through here, and it gives it a drony kind of quality. And the drone never changes pitch. So in general, that's not going to be the kind of thing you want to use, but I think it can be some cool effect sounds that are very evocative. So if you wanted to do something that had a steampunk harpsichord made out of iron in it, this would be a good method to use to try to accomplish that. And before we leave these samples, I'll show you the, uh, the other comb filter we have. So the negative comb filter has a couple different properties. It's going to sound an octave lower, and also it's going to resonate more in the odd harmonics than in every harmonic, which will give it a more hollow sound. Maybe more appropriate for drums and woodwinds. At least more appropriate than the positive is. Okay, so a reason you might not want to use samples for this purpose is the sample is going to have a natural sound if you've recorded it from nature or from smacking something in the physical world. But it's also going to be slightly unnatural because the sample is going to play exactly the same every time. Whereas if we use a noise source, a synthesized noise source, it's going to be slightly different every time. 
that may or may not matter to you, but it is an attractive feature of physical modeling synthesis for some people. So let's look at one more noise option. This is going to be my favorite noise option. We come down to twist. We have our filtered noise. Uh, since we're going to be using twist a lot today, I'm just going to say I read the manual for Surge and also watched some videos that talked about this. And everyone seems very cagey about where twist came from. And it's strange. It's not a secret. So the twist is code developed for the mutable instruments plates oscillator. That was a Euro rack module. And the code is open source. So my understanding is that it has appeared in a lot of places since. Uh, it's really a fantastic piece of coding. And it has a lot of things in it that are going to be really useful to us. So I'm going to turn off the filter for a second so we can just listen to what kind of sounds we're going to get out of this filtered noise. This can get very... It comes very close to approaching a tone with high resonance. So if I turn the key tracking back on. There are very cool uses for that. That is going to make the resonance inappropriate for our purposes here because we don't want we don't want to add that drone into our sound because that would be like this. And it's actually going to overwhelm our resonator, so not much point in that. So I'll turn the resonance down for now. Let's listen to what the clock frequency does. And now let's listen to the type. Very thunderous down here. More crackly up here. I've just done a reset to my preset. So if you get lost, this is ThoughtForm FN set up in your zip file. And what I've done here, what you want to make sure is this sustain is all the way up and the release is pretty high in your amp EG. The noise is muted. We're listening to oscillator one. The envelope's not doing anything right now. And I've activated this LPG response and LPG decay in twist. These are on every twist oscillator, but they're disabled by default. The LPG stands for low pass gate. They were all the rage in Eurorec a decade ago. It's basically a combination of a filter and an amplifier. So as the sound gets quieter, the filter is going to close and it's going to get darker. And as the sound gets louder, the filter is going to open and it's going to get brighter. These are very popular for plucky sounds because, because they have a very natural response to them. And this response is modulated by my velocity curve. And you can think of it as the volume, but it's a, it's a nonlinear thing and it's not going to behave exactly like you would expect a volume to. So I'm still going to get a fair amount of volume when I'm all the way down. 
and the decay will act more or less like the decay or release in your amplifier envelope. So that'll just make the sound longer or shorter. And it's handy to have this here because now we don't have to worry about uh, modulating our oscillator sound with an envelope. So the oscillator's just turned all the way up. So let's see how this sounds. And we can get a lot of variety out of playing with these two parameters, the type and the clock frequency. And also it's going to make a big difference what octave we're on. You'll hear that more with more decay. I know I told you not to use the resonance, but if we try it with just some, our piano is now in sort of a box. It's going to resonate especially here, because that's the middle C where it's tuned. So some resonance can be okay. But maybe avoid that C. So I could just sit here and play with these parameters all day and all week. There's a huge amount of variety you can get out of them. And that can be daunting. So it, it would help if you had a reference some physical instrument that you're trying to replicate. That would just be a good guidepost to help you not get lost fiddling with these forever. But you can also see some of the arcanity, some of the difficulty in using physical modeling synthesis is just that there's so much that can be done with it. And so I think an important thing to keep in mind, if you're playing some preset, some sound that is really, really good, it's not because their math is any better. It's because whoever designed that sound has a lot of trial and error put into it, and they're using their intuition and their ears and their artistry to shape this sound into something that really works when it could be just crap. So the point here is just that physical modeling is not a magical formula for perfect sounds. If you want to get good sounds, you have to work at it. OK, we're running pretty long. And I have a whole lot of things I still want to talk about. So I think I'm going to split the episode here. And the next time we'll talk about bowed strings using a continuous noise rather than a noise burst. And we'll see some of the problems that presents and possible solutions to them. And then we will talk about this modal resonator.
as a way of achieving inharmonic sounds using physical modeling. This episode will be out in one week rather than the usual two, because it's already recorded, it just needs editing. So that will be pretty interesting, and I hope you'll join me. Thanks for watching.